Okay, so this week we were dealing with the chi-squared distribution, and uh, as predicted, I got plenty of questions about the whole uh, degrees of freedom issue, and uh, so I thought I'd clear some of that stuff up today and do a degrees of freedom little video here, um, but it's also the census edition degrees of freedom video, considering it's uh, the census tonight, so I thought I'd keep it somewhat relevant at least. Uh, now, if you type in degrees of freedom into um, YouTube, you're going to find so many different videos trying to explain degrees of freedom to you. I haven't found one that has done a really great job. Um, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily going to do that, but I'll at least uh, try to come at it maybe a different way and show you exactly how degrees of freedom goes into um, the chi-squared distribution or doing a chi-squared test um, for independence and also a chi-squared goodness of fit test. So this first one here is the chi-squared goodness of fit test um, that we're going to be doing and this is based on the question, to which religion do you associate? Now uh, I've put all, pulled all of these values out of thin air, obviously that I've just c completely um, imagined these considering the census hasn't even been done yet. But here are the six categories of religion and I've, I'm not even sure, perhaps there are even more categories in the census. Um, and here are our observed numbers of people in each category. So the first step in doing a chi-squared test, as we dealt with this week, was we have to try to find the expected distribution. So we need to assume some kind of distribution here, and let's just say it's a uniform one. So we're going to test to see if this sample that we received could have come from a uniform distribution. So here we have the expected frequencies in each of these categories. So 1.72 million people identified would identify as Christian if that was a um, uniform distribution, etc, etc, etc. But the question is, how did we find 1.72? Most people were comfortable with this. We've got the total observed number of people in, uh, sure, 10.3 million, whatever. 10.3 million people, let's just say. To find the expected number in each category, um, we divide that by obviously six. So we've got 1.72 in each category. Fine, no problem. Now, we know that there are six categories. Why is there only five degrees of freedom? We've got to start thinking of degrees of freedom as the number of pieces of information that we have in this particular um, test. So if we're testing whether they're all effectively 1.72 million, summing up to 10.3 million. How many different pieces of information do we have in our survey? Well, you might think, okay, six, but in reality, we only have five because if you can, if I write down these first five frequencies for each of these categories here, we already know what the last one has to be because it's got to sum to 10.3 million, 10.3 million. And in fact, that's how we got all these 1.2 million values in our expected distribution here, 1.72 million. We got that by using this total, 10.3 million. So if we have these first five values in, the, in these uh, categories here, we know that this one must be 1.2 million because it has to sum to 10.3. So that's not an independent piece of information. We already know that without even getting given that piece of information. So there's only five degrees of freedom in this particular example. So K minus one degrees of freedom. Let's move on to the next example. Number of children per household. Now what I'm gonna do here is try to see if there is a Poisson distribution. Let's see if there's enough evidence to suggest this differs from a Poisson distribution. So how do we find the expected distribution if it was a Poisson distribution? Now I'm not saying you're gonna to get too many questions like this, but just for the sake of the exercise, let's see what happens. Now I've used some Excel formula here, which uh, I'll drag it down so you can see, Poisson dist, whatever. It's basically returning for me the probabilities for each category, given a mean of one, lambda equals one, or, or maybe you've seen that as mu equals one. So this is a Poisson distribution for where mu equals one. Now again, to f bump this up to the number of expected, um, free, the expected frequency in each category, well, we have to multiply this by the total, which is 0.92, or 9.2 million. Let's just say million there. 9.2 million. 
So we're going to get 3.4 million, 3.4 million, etc., etc. So this is what we would expect under a Poisson distribution with a mean of one. Now here's the question, how many degrees of freedom do we have? How many independent pieces of information do we have in this particular example? Well, in this case, we've actually only got five, which might sound strange, but we know that it sums to 9.2. And in fact, that 9.2 has created for us this expected distribution. We only knew what the expected distribution was because we multiplied by 9.2. So again, we might say, okay, there might be six degrees of freedom. And the last one we know because it has to sum to 9.2. But in fact, we don't even have six because we've used this lambda value of one. And the, the calculations might be a little bit more difficult, but knowing that this lambda value of one exists, and that's what we've used for our expected distribution, we actually only need five of these categories because the last two we can figure out based on lambda, the lambda value we've used, and the total that we've used to come up with this expected distribution. So there's two pieces Two assumptions we've used there, that it sums to 9.2 and that the mean was equal to 1. And for that reason, we've lost two, well, degrees of freedom from the total of 7. So here we have k minus 2 degrees of freedom. And in fact, if you're using a normal distribution, say you're trying to assess whether it's a normal distribution with a mean of some particular value and a standard deviation of some particular value, you're actually going to lose another one. It's going to be k minus 3 degrees of freedom because you've got yet another parameter that you've assumed when you've created your expected distribution. So that's why we have all those sort of differing k minus 1, k minus 2, k minus 3 degrees of freedom for this goodness of fit test that we're going to be conducting here. So finally then, let's have a look at this wage per household number. You might appreciate that when you have this particular scenario, we're testing perhaps for independence here to see whether males, there's an effect of gender on the amount of money that one particular person earns. Now in class, we knew that the degrees of freedom here was C minus one times R minus one, the number of columns minus one times the number of rows minus one. Now why is that? Well, again, because it's a chi-square distribution, we're going to be well, a chi-squared test, we're going to be testing whether our observed distribution matches up with a theoretical one. Now, how do we find that theoretical distribution? Well, that's the distribution based on independence. And so we're going to need these total values to try to find the particular expected um, frequencies in each of these four categories. Fine, no problem. So what I'm trying to say here is that in this particular example, Say I got rid of those three particular frequencies. If we know the totals for each of these columns and rows, so the marginal values here, which we would necessarily have to know to come up with these expected values. Well, we only have one real piece of information here because as soon as we know that's 3.3 million, we can sort of figure out exactly what exists in the three remaining categories based on the totals for each column and row. So there's only really one piece of independent information in this question. So the way we calculate it then is R minus one, C minus one. So in this particular example, where we've got three, row, three columns, two rows, we actually have two pieces of information because if I get rid of all of this, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that, that and that, if I have one piece of information here, there's still an infinite number of possibilities for what can go on the, the remaining five positions. We know, sure, that this must be, whatever, uh, 2.9 million, but we won't be able to figure out what the others have to be. So it's only when we add that additional piece of information that everything else must therefore follow. So there's only, so in this case, we actually have two degrees of freedom, two independent pieces of information. After that, the rest necessarily follow. So we actually don't get any more information with the last four categories here because we knew what they were anyway based on our uh, marginal values.
So that's gone through pretty much every category, every kind of scenario I could think of um, dealing with the degrees of freedom. I haven't done, I'm not completely finished with this um, topic yet, and there's going to be another video later on when we deal with regression on degrees of freedom, which I think is going to be a great one. So hopefully that'll uh, clear up any other issues. But this is more trying to get you to appreciate what degrees of freedom realistically are, which are um, pieces of independent information in the question. So I hope that's been helpful.